My name is Daniel Tews. I live in Indiana and I have a little story I'd like to share today about uh, how I entered into the Catholic Church. I was not, was not born Catholic, in fact, was born uh, very Lutheran, from a very strong Lutheran family. My dad is uh, one of the most faithful Christians I know on earth. He uh, um, prayed with us every night and read scriptures to us. So I, I certainly grew up knowing Jesus Christ as my savior and, and, and loving him and, and loving, loving family. It was a, it was a wonderful upbringing. Um, but I went to school to be, uh, become an engineer and uh, was gonna take an extra year uh, to finish that after four years. And my parents uh, probably wisely pulled the financial plug. And so I, I uh, joined the Marine Corps in order to uh, pay for the rest of my school. Um, this would have been in the year 2000. Um, so while I was in, um, I was actually overseas when September 11th happened. I was in Kosovo at the time. And uh, we came back and then we were sent uh, overseas then to be part of the initial invasion force in Iraq. It was during that time that I kept feeling this, this feeling that I was supposed to become a pastor. Uh, it was not something that I had considered before. Um, so I asked God for uh, some kind of sign because that would have been such a big change from what my intention had been uh, to go and finish my engineering degree. Um, so when I uh, returned home, I obviously you know, greeted my wife with great joy. We were very happy to be back together. But in one of our first conversations, she said, you know, Daniel, I was thinking that this feeling that you're supposed to be a pastor. I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. Okay, there's my sign, God, I'll, I'll go. And, um, well, then I call my parents and they're, of course, we're happy to hear I'm home safely. And my dad, in that first con conversation said, you know, Daniel, I have this feeling that you're supposed to be a pastor. I so, said, oh, well, there it is, God. And well, I call, I've got two younger sisters. I call of the two. One of them said the same thing. And, and they said they had not talked with each other during this time. That it was just that they, but they all said that same thing. So I thought, well, there's my sign. And so I finished my degree. I went to uh, um, the Lutheran Seminary. Um, it was a four year program there. And after that, I was ordained as a pastor and um, sent to my first call, which was in uh, rural South Dakota. Just absolutely beautiful country, the most wonderful people up there, and uh, just I absolutely loved it. Um, just becoming a pastor and, and teaching Bible studies and studying the scriptures, all those things that, that I, I love to do. Uh, one of my good friends from the seminary had a call to Minnesota, and we would talk on the phone often, uh, weekly or every other week, uh, just about things in the ministry or family and whatnot. And one day he told a, a funny story. Uh, it, it was, Sad, it was, it was his, his father who had been ill for a long time, passed away, but um, the day before the funeral, he met the pastor at the viewing and, and uh, that was gonna do his father's funeral. And, and he was a, some non-denominational or Baptist background, it was what his father was at the time. And so he talked to him and, and my friend told him that he was a Lutheran pastor and that everything was fine. Well, he was, my friend was surprised to hear during the sermon, during the funeral, the pastor looked down at him and start pounding in the pulpit and saying, there are some people who believe that in order to become a pastor, you have to go to school. You have to learn languages and, and teachings. He then goes on to explain how he had been a lay person and uh, then the Holy Spirit told him and the next day he was a pastor. When my friend told me that story, you know, it just seems like a small story, but it had such big implications to me because I recognized immediately that something was wrong with that. I knew at the seminary how much I had learned, how much I had grown and informed myself as a, as a, as a teacher and understander of, of, of scriptures and, and the teachings. And I knew that if I didn't have that, I would not have you know, been as effective as I was. And so I thought, well, what better way to prove that Lutheranism is what it should be and that this is how we're supposed to be teaching our people is to go to the very sources. Um, even uh, Martin Luther had the great sort thing, you always say, go back to the, so the sources, go back to the font of knowledge. And so I thought, well, that's a very Lutheran idea, so I'm gonna do that. So I started with the Didache and started reading through that. Now, it was nothing profound, but immediately I came to a recognition that what I was reading there just didn't sound very Lutheran. In fact, there may have been some things in the Didache. So this is written by the, the people who were literally taught by the apostles themselves. The, the next thing that was written after the New Testament was completed 
that if I said them in front of a Lutheran congregation, I might get in trouble. <laughs> um, but it didn't, it wasn't much, you know, and so I, I kept going and, and started going through uh, Tertullian and, and, and many of the, the early church fathers up through and, and kept going all the way to, to St. Augustine. And, and as I was reading through these more and more and more, there, there became a, a growing and growing recognition that what I was reading was by no means Lutheran. In fact, it sounded very, very Catholic. Now, what my understanding of the Catholic Church had been up until that time was just a caricature of what the Lutheran ter Church taught that the Catholic Church taught. And so there were some of the, the common mistakes that people believe about the Catholic Church, that they, they worship Mary, or that, that you know, whatever the Pope says at any given time is perfectly true, and we have to you know, do all these things. And, and so I decided to actually purchase a Catholic catechism and started reading through that. Um, so again, this is my, I, I dedicated my first half of the day to just, um, again, still reading scriptures, time in prayer, and now with studying the early church fathers. And uh, instead of reading the, the Book of Concord and, and the, the small catechism of Luther, I just started reading the Catholic catechism just to see uh, what it was that the Catholic church taught. And I still have this catechism to this day and I still read it a lot. And it's so, I love doing this because I go back at the time, I was highlighting in red all those things that see this is bad. This is what the Catholic Church that the Catholic Church teaches that is against what we know of you know from Scripture and and so these were in there. So to this day, I still go back and I, I kind of smile and I thought you know hey this is it's a, such a beautiful passage now. But at the time you know because that conflicted with my Lutheran understanding of things, I highlighted it red and so I still I still like those passages when I come across them today. But there was something about the Catholic Catechism that I really liked. The Lutheran Catechism is, is very short, and it, it kind of just covers the basics about the Lord's Prayer, about communion, baptism, things like that. It's, it's very short. But the Catholic Catechism has everything in it. Um, if you haven't read the Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church, I strongly encourage it. It's a beautiful work, and it covers everything. Not only the, the things about theology, about Christ, about the Church, but there's huge portions about how we should even live together as, as community, even as nations. It kind of says that if, you know, if we are who we are as followers of Christ, it actually affects how we live together in our nations, how we act as, as a people together. And so it's, it's a wonderful work in that sense. So for me, I really, that, 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 that drew me in uh, very strongly at that, that time. And I, I, that, that was really meaningful to me. So as I continued to study uh, the, the church fathers, I kept coming to a realization that there were some pretty significant differences between what I was taught as a Lutheran and what I was teaching to my people as a pastor and with what the early, early church was saying themselves. And it started me to wonder how the Lutherans came to the conclusions that they did, especially when they directly contradicted things in the early church fathers. And one of the things that came very early to me was a question of mine is, who was Luther? What was Luther? What was his role? And if he had a certain role in the church, how did he get that role? Because it became to the point that inside the, the Lutheran documents, if there was a place that, that Luther contradicted, say what St. Augustine said, the Lutheran church would go with what Luther said. If Luther uh, contradicted something that Tertullian said, they would go with what Luther said. Or every one of the church fathers, they would always go back to what Luther said, even if it was in direct contradiction to the teachings of the church, the historical faith that was believed at all times and in all places, at least in the, in the, amongst Christendom. And so I asked myself the question, what was Luther? What was he? He spoke, he railed against the Pope and how that, that, that idea of a papal office was not scriptural, that it was used for great evil. And yet what Luther was taking on him um, for himself as far as an authority to be a teaching authority of the church was far greater than I realized that the Pope ever had for himself. He was able on his own to knock down the number of sacraments in the church to just baptism and the Lord's Supper knocking out all the other ones on his own. He was able to, on his own, change the number of books in the Bible. I mean, taking out um, all of the, what I always understood, the Catholic books of the Bible, but um, then in my realization through the Septuagint that they were there, and at least the Bible that Jesus would have quoted from, the, the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus would have quoted from, had the other books of the Catholic Church in them. And so what gave him the authority 
to make such sweeping changes within the church, and yet that was an authority that he was not willing to grant to the one that was actually uh, given the keys uh, that was passed down from St. Peter through the popes up to his day. And so that became a very difficult question for me. And I started then uh, reaching out to some of my other pastor friends and asking him that question. And the, the, the general Lutheran answer to that is that he is he's kind of another church father, or he was just very intelligent, or that he you know, knew his Bible so well that he was able to, to do these things, up to and including that you know, there's some that would say that he is a, a prophet that's kind of pointed out in the book of Revelation. And so not many people go that route, but there's, there's quite a few different options for that. But especially the idea that he was a church father, that's kind of what it came up to. But if that was the case still, why would he be able to contradict other church fathers and have that, that teaching authority over them? Um, however, you know, for what he was taking, he was a kind of a, a super pope in, in what he was. So that was a, a, something that was really leading me along in uh, um, trying to find out why Lutheran doctrine was so in contradiction to what was taught in the early church. At that time, I was really having more and more of a fascination with the Catholic Church based on what I had been reading in the catechism. And I was, I was going to some different Catholic blogs at the time as well, just trying to learn more and more what the Catholic Church taught. Um, and so it was definitely was, was an interest growing in my mind, um, that combined with what I was reading in the Church Fathers. But it was during that time that a, a pretty significant thing happened, um, and that was I found out about the Rosary. I mean, I wouldn't say I found out about it. You kind of Most Protestants know there is such a thing as a rosary, and we had seen them before, but I hadn't really given it much thought. Um, but one of the things that I liked to do during that time in my time of prayer is I would, um, oftentimes my office was right next to it, I would go into the, the church and just, I liked to, to kneel and, and, and just and do my prayers there, which is very peaceful. Now, obviously, the Lutherans don't have the, the, the body of Christ there in a, in a tabernacle or of anything of that nature, um, but it still was just a peaceful place for me to go and pray. But sometimes it was a, you know, as we often do, we have difficulty with our minds wandering. And, and I always wanted something that I could just, you know, kind of keep track of where I was, in a sense, prayer beads of something like that. And so as long as I was already kind of dabbling and reading in, in different things of the Catholic Church, um, I thought I would uh, try a rosary. So. I received my first rosary actually from my wife, which is a, a kind of a story on its own. She's having a parallel story at the same time that I'd like to touch on as well. But I printed out just a sheet from the internet about how to pray a rosary and I had that sheet in front of me and started going through it. Um, now, from a Lutheran perspective, there's a, you know, some little difficulties. Uh, at least the Hail Mary, the first half of it, I think any Lutheran or Protestant can pray no problem. You know, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. All of that is purely from the Bible. You know, we're hearing it from, you know, where St. Elizabeth, uh, our, our Lady visits St. Elizabeth, uh, from the angels greeting to Mary, no problem. But it's the second half of, a, of it where we're actually asking Mary for her intercession that, you know, a, a Lutheran for so long is, is taught that we only pray to Jesus. And, we, and, and, and that, that, that was a difficult thing to do. And so just to ask for intercession, that second half was. But I, I went ahead and tried it anyway and, uh, and went through and, and it, it was difficult, but, uh, but made it through. And, and I actually started doing that as a, a daily habit um, almost immediately. It, it, was, it was very, uh, became very important to me. And uh, as, I, as I continued my, my journey through this, and uh, that, that rosary was kind of always alongside of me. And I, I, became, I began praying it every day and asking for wisdom, uh, especially if there was any, if I had anything that I was asking for, it was, it was show me the truth um, and lead me to where that I'm, I'm supposed to be because I, I loved being a pastor. I loved what I did. I loved the, the time in prayer and study and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, but I wanted to follow the truth and was becoming more and more convinced as I was, as I was going through this that there uh, may be some, some serious issues with remaining in the pastoral ministry. At one point in time even, I um, sat down with my father, the, the strong Lutheran, strong Christian, man of God, um, love him dearly, and I told him some of the problems that I was having. And he said, you know, Lent's coming up during this time, why don't you try stopping everything Catholic? Stop praying the rosary, stop reading anything Catholic, 
stop reading the church fathers just you know and, and just you know go back to to what you know you know you maybe you're just getting too overwhelmed with these with one side of things and so I thought you know that was a that was a, a good idea a good suggestion and so I did that um, even stop praying the rosary so it was something really fascinating happened I had this just constant feeling in my mind this constant pull back to the rosary. I, I didn't pray it. I didn't pray it, but it, it never stopped. It was like Our Lady was just pulling me back into this. And, and it, was, it, it was very interesting, you know, it, and, uh, and I, that was very telling to me. And so after Lent was over, I really, you know, jumped back both feet into it. The fact that I could not go those, you know, 40 days uh, without praying that rosary uh, was, was just, was really cool. And I think that was just something that, that was really convincing me uh, that, you know, where I was going was the right place to be. And I got to change gears a little bit too because I think there was something very fascinating happening at the same time. So I'm in my office, I'm going through all of these things, and uh, my wife, I didn't know how she would respond to what I was learning. So I started perhaps just dropping some little hints and some things like that, and, and occasionally to get something, you know, well, that's a little weird for a Lutheran pastor to say, but okay, you know, and, but she really wasn't, uh, um, wasn't real open to it, so I was, I was very careful. I didn't want to unload because I had spent, you know, months and at this time years even studying, and that was what was bringing me to this other side. But all this time, uh, my wife was having her own, she didn't know it at the time, but conversion experience as well. Um, she was invited by a friend of hers to be a part of a women's group and they read works of classic literature. So each month they would have a different book. Um, they would read this, this book, um, anything from you know Dostoevsky to uh, Wendell Berry. There was just a whole bunch of really neat books uh, that I loved. I'm, I'm a huge reader and so I thought that was really neat. And so she got to go um, with them once a month, then they would meet. And the neat thing about this was all the other people in the group, all the other ladies were Catholic. And, uh, you know, but this was uh, one of just reading classic literature, so there was nothing, you know, particularly threatening about that. And so once a month when we got together at um, one of the ladies' houses, she lived out in, out in the country at a beautiful farmhouse. She had, I believe, seven kids. There was another woman there that had eight children, another that had six, uh, two more that had five, and one that uh, her friend only had three. Um, but it was funny, amongst that group, we, who in, with our five children, had one of the smaller families in it. But it was really cool because all the dads would um, serve lunch and watch all these kids and that gave the mom some time to go in a back room and they would discuss the book that they would read and, and uh, they would spend, as they were often do, some of the time talking about the book and much of the time talking about being a mother and a wife and uh, homeschooling and all that, things like that. So, um, but she loved this group and uh, um, she told me later that one of the things that struck her was about how all of these women, lay women, were showing signs of the faith that she had never seen amongst the Protestant side of things, not in the Lutheran church, not anywhere else. Every room of their house had some sort of religious icon or a crucifix or a picture of Our Lady or a saint, every room. And she realized that our house, you know, we had, of course had a Bible in the living room and I think we probably had a cross somewhere else, but it wasn't, it wasn't nearly to that level. The way that these women, she said, were able to just bring the faith into everything that they did, their teaching, their speech, their, uh, you know, how they went about their lives, she was so impressed. She hadn't really said that, but later on, as I was going further in my journey and I started to share with Shana, you know, I think that the Catholic Church is the true church. It's the church that was started by Christ. It's the church that was there from the beginning and started sharing these things with her. She was obviously resistant at first, you know, since just because my livelihood and our home and everything that we loved was tied up in this Lutheran identity. But she at the same time said that these women that she had been spending so much time with and they were becoming such close friends were such a powerful witness to her that she was seeing that there was something about the Catholic Church that was drawing her as well. So actually it was her that um, at this time then after you know some of these discussions, we were having many discussions about it, that she 
actually bought my first rosary for me that I was that I was using in my office. And so she was coming along, and, and as we discussed more and more things, and I would show some of the problems theologically with what the Lutheran Church taught and how that compared to what the Catholic Church taught, um, some of the things that we believed that the Catholic Church was actually teaching and how the catechism said, no, this is actually what it is. It's a much more nuanced understanding or, or, or completely different than what the Protestants thought the Catholics taught. Um, as those things came on and on, she became um, more and more understanding of the, the truth of the Catholic Church, and you know, she became very enthusiastic about it. And uh, um, we started even sharing it with our, our Catholic friends, and they, and they were very encouraging about it and, um, and, and very helpful. There came a time then that it was a, a period of suffering in this, as we both knew what we believed that that Jesus and our Blessed Mother were leading us to do, um, where this path of trying to follow the truth, find, trying to follow the history of the teachings of the church, which was unbroken uh, from the time of Christ up until now um, in the Catholic Church, but you know, it was such a, an overlay of something totally foreign to it in the Protestant side. This period of suffering, really we defined it as trying to keep one foot in both camps. Um, I was trying to be very faithful to what I had pledged as a Lutheran pastor to teach Lutheran theology. So in my Bible studies, in my sermons and things like that, I was still teaching faithfully uh, what the Lutheran Church taught. I was not trying to be a, a, a crypto-Catholic in this and, and, and try to, to do anything of that nature because I believed that would go against what I had pledged to do and, and would have been not fair to the, the people in my congregation. But at the same time, I was studying so much behind the scenes and uh, um, in this. I, I think there were some good opportunities during that time to correct wrong teachings about the Catholic Church uh, in those Bible studies and in different con uh, conversations with various Lutherans. So I think that was helpful, but it, it was still very difficult uh, to try to, to, to live both sides. So we knew that at some point in time, we were gonna need to make a decision. What I decided to do was approach, um, especially Four of my very close pastoral friends, uh, good uh, theologians, all of them in the in the Lutheran Church, and uh, and, a, and a couple more uh, that just that I didn't see as often. But I approached all of these men with what I had found, um, and I asked them, "Look, I don't want to be right. Please find a place where you can say, no, Daniel, here it is. You're wrong. This is what it actually is, and I, and I could just go back to doing what I love to do." So we would discuss at, at great lengths um, our different understandings, and I, I really posed them uh, two big questions that stood out. One I, uh, was, who was Luther? Um, what was Luther? What was his role? What gave him that teaching authority? I, I you know, really came to the conclusion that Luther was a super pope, that you know, he was able to, by himself, change teachings of the church, and he always claimed that he you know, went back to the early church, and that you know, was not true, and I showed that. And, and in, in many cases, I showed where the Lutheran fathers were misquoting very intentionally the church fathers uh, over and over, taking things out of context. Uh, and, and, and so that was, that was one of my big arguments. Um, the other question that I came to my Lutheran friends about is actually probably the number one reason I'm a Catholic. Um, people have asked before if there was in just one single reason, and for me it is the, the existence of the office of the papacy. And if it wasn't Luther, what I also realized is that there, somebody has to become that ultimate arbiter of what is in and what is out. Uh, probably, if we're honest, most people, that line runs through themselves. <laughs> they are their own pope. Um, but, but for others, it, you know, it might be Luther, it might be Calvin or Zwingli or one of the other, um, one of the other Protestant fathers. Or in many non-denominational congregations, it changes when they get a new pastor. And without a pope, it is complete and utter chaos. Uh, there are, I mean, depending on how they're counted, between 20 and 30,000 different denominations. There's over 6,000 Lutheran denominations alone. And this, to be this understanding, you know, going back to that original thing that made me think about my, my friend at his, at his father's funeral, where the pastor got up and said that people think you need to go to school in order to be a pastor, when all you need is the, the leadings of the Holy Spirit to get up and preach. This chaos, this every person being their own arbiter of truth, I knew was a problem. And so the Catholic Church, um, they also, obviously we have a pope, 
But this pope was given, instituted by Christ, and it's an unbroken line over the 2,000 years since then that we still have the same pope. And so this is the one thing, if anything else, is why I believe I'm a Catholic. It's because I can know without a doubt that I'm within this, this visible church on earth, that those who are following Christ, following Our Lady, ultimately just knowing that we're inside the authority of the, the church and that uh, when huge questions of doctrine come and go, there is somebody that says, this is the way that it is. Um, between the church and the councils, it has kept the truth and we can know what it is the truth. If you're Protestant, and what I was doing at the time, is you have to constantly weigh every single bit of theology and try to determine, looking at scripture, looking at other things, is this the right one or is this the right one? And it's, it's tiresome. I went to my, my friends with these questions. Um, ultimately, they admitted they did not have answers to them. And, uh, and they, even after I left and became Catholic, they still continued to meet from time to time and even invited other ones in. I know at least one of them now also is, a, is Catholic. But at least I, I wanted to bring them these questions. And other them thanked me just to say that they were better able to articulate their own faith at the time. So and I'm, I'm, I'm glad about that. I, I told them, don't mischaracterize what the Catholic Church teaches. If you are going to believe that, you know, still since, you know, since the 16th century when Luther said we need to split with the Catholic Church, if you still have that reason for split for another year, go ahead. But every year, ask yourself, you know, do we still have enough that is separating the church that we should continue protesting. If not, come back. And so every year I, I encourage them to ask themselves that. And uh, so at least one of them has, has said, no, we don't have that reason anymore. And um, he's, he's come to join the, the mother church as well. So my wife and uh, five children and I moved back to uh, near where we grew up in Indiana. We wanted to find a parish that was faithful, uh, orthodox, uh, boldly Catholic. I thought if I'm uh, leaving so much on this side, I wanted to find one that was very, very intentional about being Catholic, very proud of that. And, and we found a wonderful parish here um, in, uh, in this part of Indiana. And uh, um, so we went through, this would have been um, 2015, I left and then in, uh, we started RCIA almost immediately. At Easter Vigil, my wife and I and our five children all uh, uh, received our, the sacraments that we were missing and, it, and we entered the church at Easter Vigil 2016. And it's, a, it's been a wonderful journey, continuing just a, my a love of the, the rosary and the teachings of the church, and especially spending time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, it was something that I looked forward to even before I was able to do that, but to do you know, a holy hour and, and just know that Jesus is present, that's been a very powerful thing for me. It's something that, you know, sadly there's so many tools that are uh, Protestant brothers and sisters don't have the Our, our, our Lady, the uh, intercession of the saints, uh, the you know time spent in the presence of the Blessed Eucharist. It's just uh, it's it's a uh, um, I've I've really enjoyed all these you know and helped me tremendously these tools these gifts that are given to us in the Catholic Church.